Thank you to President Lagarde for her introduction. And now we come to the first of our two panel discussions. Again, let me remind you to send questions via Mentimeter on menti.com using the voting code 47228727. So the first panel is called Navigating Through a Storm, Policy Challenges in the Current Macroeconomic Environment. The panelists will look at current challenges such as the weakened economic outlook, inflation, geopolitical tensions, and an aging population, and what these mean for macroprudential policy. This panel is chaired by Pablo Hernández de Coz, Governor of the, uh, the Banco de España and Chair of the ESRB Advisory Technical Committee. He will introduce the panel members and lead the discussion. Governor Hernández de Coz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Connie. And good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this uh, first discussion panel of the sixth uh, annual conference of the European Systemic Risk Board. In this uh, roundtable, we will be focusing on identified challenges affecting the conduct of macroprudential policies or macro policies more in general in the current uh, turbulent times, which are having important repercussions for the economic and financial environment. As uh, noted by President Lagarde during her welcome address, in the course of this year, we have witnessed an increase in financial stability risks. The appalling invasion of Ukraine by Russia, initiated as uh, we were recovering the activity levels previous to the pandemic, has contributed to either full, new, or exacerbate existing systemic vulnerabilities in Europe and beyond. The spikes in energy food prices, continued disruption of global supply chains, and demand pressures have resulted in higher and more persistent inflation across the board. This has triggered a response of monetary policy, which is now normalizing around the world, contributing to tighter global financial conditions and increased volatility and liquidity tensions. And it is the combination of the uncertainty derived from the war and more in general from geopolitical tensions with the increase of inflation and the rising interest rates that has generated ultimately a general deterioration of the economic outlook with, for example, one year ahead recession probabilities having increased markedly in both the euro area and other major advanced economies. This uh, challenging financial stability outlook is well laid out in the warning on vulnerabilities in the European financial system that the European Systemic Risk Board issued last September. Indeed, the ESRB has alerted of the high thing uncertainty and the increased probability of tail risk scenarios materializing. In particular, the ESRB has warned of three severe systemic risks. First, the deterioration in the macroeconomic outlook combined with the tightening of financing conditions, leading to negative consequences in terms of balance sheet stress for non-financial corporates and households, especially in sectors and member states that are most affected by rapidly increasing energy prices. Second, a possible sharp fall in asset prices, leading to large mark-to-market losses, amplified market volatility and liquidity strains. In addition, the increase in the level and volatility of energy and commodity prices has generated large margin calls for participants in these markets, and this has created liquidity strains for some participants. And third, the potential deterioration of asset quality and the profitability outlook of credit institutions. While the European banking sector as a whole is well capitalized, a pronounced deterioration in the macroeconomic outlook would imply a renewed increase in credit risk at the time when some credit institutions are still in the process of working out COVID-19 pandemic-related asset quality problems. Without forgetting, of course, that the resilience of credit institutions is also affected by structural factors, including overcapacity, competition from new providers of financial services, as well as exposure to cyber and climate risks. Besides, the ESRB has identified a number of other risks that are deemed elevated, for example, in relation to imbalances in the residential and commercial real estate sectors, which are more acute in some member states uh, than in others, the likelihood of large-scale cyber uh, incidents, and high public indebtedness. Summing up, there is no shortage of challenges, and in this context, preserving and enhancing the resilience of the union's financial sector remains essential to ensure its capacity to support the real economy if and when financial stability risks materialize. Credit institutions can act as a first line of defense by ensuring that their provisioning practices 
and capital planning properly account for expected and unexpected losses that may be caused by the deterioration in the risk environment. Micro and macro prudential capital buffers that are consistent with the prevailing level of risk can also help to ensure credit institutions' resilience. Some national authorities have already tightened macro prudential policies, while others are currently exploring whether these policies could be implemented to address vulnerabilities. Preserving or further building up macro prudential buffers would support credit institutions' resilience and enable the authorities to release these buffers if and when risks materialize and negatively impact credit institutions' balance sheets. But as ever, this decision should be made considering each member state's specific macrofinancial outlook and banking sector conditions in order to limit the risk of procyclicality. Financial stability risk beyond the banking sector should also be addressed. This requires tackling vulnerabilities and increasing the resilience of non-bank financial institutions and market-based finance. In this regard, the ESRB has repeatedly noted that a lack of tools is hampering authorities' ability to address financial stability risk beyond the banking sector. It has called for authorities to be provided with such tools, for example, in the context of the review of the prudential rules governing investment funds and insurance. The current heightened risk environment makes this more urgent than ever. Against this background, let me now turn to the four distinguished panelists that are together with me today, Claudio Borio, Alfred Kammer, Lucrecia Reichling, and Ricardo Reis, who are very well known to you in the audience and therefore need little presentation. Let me, anyway, briefly introduce them to you by alphabetical order. Claudio Borio is the head of the Monetary and Economic Department of the Bank for International Settlements. He has held various positions of responsibility at the BIS over the last 35 years, and during this period, he has authored numerous publications in the fields of monetary policy, banking, finance, and issues related to financial stability. Alfred Kammer is the director of the European Department at the International Monetary Fund. In that capacity, he leads and oversees the IMF's work with Europe on financial stability surveillance, monetary and macroprudential policies, and financial reg regulation, among other key areas. Lucrecia Reigling is professor of economics at the London Business School with a background in central banking. She was, for example, director general of research at the European Central Bank. Last but not least, Ricardo Reis is the A.W. Phillips professor of economics at the London School of Economics. Widely regarded as one of the top research macroeconomists of his generation, Ricardo has published extensively on monetary and fiscal policy, inflation and business cycles. So thank you very much, Claudio, Alfred, Lucrecia and Ricardo for kindly accepting the invitation to be uh, with us uh, today. As discussed uh, with you previously, I would first uh, give the floor to Alfred. Alfred, please, uh, you have the floor. Thanks, uh, uh, Pablo. Uh, and, and thank you uh, for inviting me to speak at this event. Uh, the financial system indeed is uh, facing challenging time. And Pablo, you have started up on a list of events and uh, risks we are facing. Russia's war in Ukraine, the extreme rise in energy prices, high and persistent inflation, rapid monetary policy tightening, a slowdown in US and China economic activity, the undoing of the peace dividend, and repricing of almost all financial assets, and the list goes on. What we can take comfort from is the fact that financial markets function orderly and the European banking system remains strong in 2022. This is testimony to the quality of European regulators and supervisors. This is also a result of the reforms implemented since the global financial crisis, which included the introduction and widespread use of macro uh, prudential policy tools. But the next years may prove difficult still. While we are only projecting a shallow recession for Europe for 2023, most risks are pointing to the downside. Against this background, it is appropriate to reflect on the role of macroprudential policy at the current juncture. The Great Moderation exemplified a divine coincidence where optimal monetary policy could simultaneously stabilize inflation and minimize unemployment. But it became also apparent in the low for long interest rate environment that there was no divine coincidence 
matching, risk taking and leverage, and it introduced financial vulnerabilities. Also today, there is no divine coincidence. Rapid monetary policy tightening that aims to bring inflation down to target is now boosting risk and term premia, and it drains market liquidity. These financial stresses raise the specter of financial instability. For example, the Volcker disinflation of the early 1980s contributed to the savings and loan crisis in the US and the banking and sovereign debt crisis in Latin America. The first line approach to resolving this conflict between monetary policy and financial stability is to let monetary policy focus on its inflation objective and use macrodential policy to ensure financial stability. Macrodential policy, however, may not be powerful enough, especially in high pressure circumstances and when it comes to the less regulated non bank financial intermediation sector. Therefore, each policy, monetary and macrodential, must be cognizant of its effect on the other. The ECB's monetary policy strategy review recognized that monetary policy could affect the stability of the financial system and it viewed financial stability as a precondition for price stability. With this, let me now outline our views on the desirable macro prudential policy stance in Europe. Macro prudential policy in the EU should lean towards maintaining its existing stance while reflecting country specific conditions and be ready to accommodate should a downside macroeconomic scenario materialize. That's it in a nutshell. Let me elaborate. I will start with the cyclical macrodential tools, such as the counter cyclical capital buffer. These tools ensure that banks build up cushions in good times when the counter cyclical capital buffer is activated and accumulated, and use these cushions to continue lending during downturns when the buffer is deactivated and drawn down. Unfortunately, most European countries could not accumulate counter-cyclical capital buffers quickly enough during the short post-pandemic recovery and still have buffers at zero. But many countries have announced intentions to increase the counter-cyclical capital buffers later this or early next year, usually to around 1 to 2 percent. When these imminent increases are already incorporated into bank capital planning, as is the case for France, Germany, and Sweden, they are almost as good as implemented. For us, maintaining the stance of macrodential policy means using current counter cyclical capital buffer settings and announced plans as an anchor. A loosening of buffers from these levels is premature, as financial excesses are still present and sometimes they are even increasing. A marked tightening of buffers is not advisable either as it may make macrodential policy procyclical. If the credit cycle turns, the pressure on banks to comply with higher counter cyclical capital buffers requirements may reduce credit supply and amplify a downturn. The other part of the macrodential toolkit are structural borrower based measures, such as loan to asset, debt to income, and debt service to income limits in mortgage lending. Tighter borrower based measures help build resilience during buoyant market conditions. But we would urge caution on initiatives to loosen borrower based measures to support financial conditions at the current stage of the cycle. Looser borrower based measures may increase fragility and household financial risks in the still imbalanced housing market. Additionally, empirical evidence confirms that the relaxations of borrower based measures historically had little effect on financial conditions in downturns. In fact, given our clear understanding of the spectrum of risks, countries could now augment loan to asset and debt to income regulations by requiring banks to stress test the debt service to income ratios on new mortgages. This has been done in some countries already, like Finland, Lithuania, Malta, and Slovakia. The authorities could also issue recommendations of low limits to avoid lending at high loan to asset and debt service to income ratios. 
countries can supplement the core macroprudential tools with sectoral measures, such as the systemic risk buffer to target specific risk, such as those in real estate. For example, Belgium, Germany, Lithuania and Slovenia have recently imposed macroprudential capital charges on banks' mortgage exposures to better protect banks and the macroeconomy from adverse housing market shocks. These sectoral measures are welcome, and the fact that they are targeted gives countries more flexibility in their implementation while limiting unintended consequences. Our advice towards maintaining the existing macroprudential policy stance may, of course, change in a downside economic scenario. Then the authorities can release or deactivate the countercyclical capital buffer, consistent with the purpose of enabling bank lending in a severe downturn. Let me make three further points. First, it is critical to keep enhancing the macroprudential policy toolkit. If this toolkit is insufficient, a specter of a financial crisis may break down the separation between monetary and macroprudential policies, forcing a degree of financial dominance in policymaking. In this context, we look forward to progress in the European Commission's legislative review of the EU macroprudential framework, which started in 2021. This review could usefully include measures towards an earlier buildup of the countercyclical capital buffer to higher steady state targets, a priority that has been underscored by recent events. Furthermore, the review could ensure that all member states should have access to basic borrower based macroprudential tools to mitigate housing market risks and imbalances. The question of improving coordination and consistency of macroprudential policy across member states while accounting for country-specific characteristics, also deserves analysis. Second, not only monetary policy, but also sound fiscal policy is important for the functioning of markets, as the re recent British guilt market episode demonstrated. Markets can respond violently to unsustainable fiscal policies. There are other examples of fiscal policy that could impact financial stability, such as windfall taxes. Finally, we should not lose sight of microprudential regulation. A timely and faithful implementation of internationally agreed Basel III bank capital standards would underpin global financial stability. Improving the regulation and supervision of non-bank financial intermediaries is challenging, but critical. Given the global nature of the sector, coordination with the Financial Stability Board and international standard setting bodies is key. The current focus on liquidity risk management practices of non-bank financial intermediaries and on data gap is the correct one. With this, let me conclude. The resilience of Europe's financial system should not be taken for granted. The financial system withstood the pandemic and the war relatively well only thanks to hard and forward-looking work since the global financial crisis by financial sector policymakers. Complacency is dangerous. Policymakers should see recent events as a wake up call to prepare the financial system for whatever the future may hold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alfred. Uh, let's now uh, move uh, to, to Claudio. Claudio, please. Well, uh, thank you, Pablo. And I'm delighted to be on this panel and to reflect on an issue which is very close to my heart. That's the relationship between macroprudential frameworks and uh, and monetary policy, and particularly at the current juncture. Now, this is a huge topic, so uh, let me just uh, be quite selective and, and start from the big picture. Uh, I think it's useful to have this as context. Um, policymakers are facing unprecedented conditions by uh, post-World uh, War II standards, and that is recession risk in the context of a combination of monetary policy tightening in order to bring inflation down and widespread financial vulnerabilities. Um, by that, I mean, in particular, historically high debt levels, both private and public, and elevated asset prices, particularly those in, in, in real estate. Now, why do I say unprecedented? Well, because what we're facing is, in some respects, a combination of two stylized different types of uh, recession. First is the recession that we saw until the mid 1980s, which one could call inflation induced recessions. That is, inflation would go up, monetary policy would tighten, and this would cause a downturn in addition to an exogenous shock at the time. But because you had generally financial repression, 
there was little change in indicators of the financial cycle, such as debt, uh, credit, um, property prices, and, and the like. After the mid-1980s, and leaving aside the COVID crisis, which is sui generis, we shifted from what one, call, on what one could call financial cycle-induced recessions. That is, inflation was low and stable, so there was no need to raise interest rates but financial booms turned into busts. And of course, the great financial crisis is the biggest example of that. Now, given financial liberalization, what happened was that there was much more scope for financial uh, imbalances to, to grow. A couple of implications from all this. First of all, um, if you like, the macroeconomic background is combining the worst of all two, poss two possible worlds, and we have little precedent to go by. And second, and importantly, central banks' room for policy maneuver is much more limited than what we saw in the past, because monetary policy and financial stability interventions would pull in opposite directions, as we saw in the recent case in the UK. And in fact, the adoption of balance sheet policies to set the monetary policy stance has greatly com uh, complicated communication, because it has blurred the distinction between setting the stance of policy and backstopping the financial system. Something that in fact, uh, post the GFC, at least at the beginning, the, the ECB was very careful to, uh, to do. So let me turn to the state of the financial system, which in a way is a kind of tale of two subsystems. We know that banks are in much better shape uh, than they were pre-great uh, financial crisis, large as a result of uh, the financial reforms to the point that they were considered to be part of the solution as opposed to being part of the problem during the COVID crisis. But clearly, as was mentioned uh, before, there is no reason for, for complacency. The high debt levels mean that the uh, losses on exposures to firms and households could be substantial, depending on how the macroeconomy uh, evolves. And we discussed this in the annual economic report of the BIS, where we had some simulations. And those on exposures to non-bank financial firms, non-bank financial intermediaries, are, if you like, a big known unknown. Indeed, the non-bank financial intermediation sector is more vulnerable. This is the second subsystem. Just uh, think, for example, of the dash for cash in March 2020 or the recent problems in, in the UK. Now, this sector has grown in leaps and bounds following the great financial crisis. And this was actually partly an intended um, uh, result of regulation, because the idea was to try and push out the risks into the less leveraged part of the financial system on balance. But in fact, there is quite a lot of hidden leverage and liquidity mismatches, as also we heard before in this sector, which means that there are highly opaque direct and in particular indirect bank exposures to, to the sector. And there was a lot of risk taking during the phase of low for long, which means that there is plenty of tinder to uh, ignite the, the fire. And what was not intended or planned at the time was what I would call disappointing progress in developing a systemic oriented macro prudential type set of regula regulation for the sector, which I think needs to, this is a gap that needs to be filled with some urgency. Now, let me say a few words about the role of macroprudential policy at the current junction. And here, let me say that I fully agree with uh, President Lagarde said and what uh, Alfred said before. That is, that it's important that macroprudential policy now focuses on building resilience in the financial system ahead of the possible storm uh, in case uh, financial stress breaks out. This is indeed the very mandate of uh, macroprudential policy. And it would be of great help for fiscal policy as well, because a solid financial system increases the policy headroom for, for monetary policy. Now, let me say that, and here, Alfred, I, I agree with you in substance, but there is something that makes me slightly uneasy, which is when people talk about the macroprudential stance, which to me suggests a short-term stabilization focus, and for which there is quite a lot of pressure at the moment. I don't think macroprudential policy is well suited, even if one tried to use it in, in, in that context. Uh, macroprudential policy is more like a super tanker. You have long implementation lags, partly and because of political economy constraints, but also technical ones. 
and the tools are not really designed for short-term macro, uh, macro stabilization purposes. I think the COVID crisis may have given the wrong impression, but that was sui generis because it was entirely exogenous, not the result of the buildup of financial imbalances. It was fundament fundamentally temporary, so the whole idea was to put, a, put in place a bridge and emerge an emergency situation called for an emergency response. Indeed, I would suggest that there is scope to strengthen and reflect more on the built-in stabilizers in macro prudential frameworks, because less discretion also means less relevance for the so-called inaction bias and less relevance for timing problems. By this, I mean, for example, low loan-to-value ratios and low DTI ratios, which somehow reduce the endogenous um, uh, elasticity of credit uh, with respect to, to asset prices or income, through the cycle collateral measures, and importantly, also a positive neutral level of the counter-cyclical buffer, as opposed to having to raise it only when a problem, there are signs that problems are building up. Now, it is monetary policy which is best suited to adjust at the margin, taking macroprudential policy as given, because monetary policy is more nimble. And indeed, I would suggest that in the process, monetary policy can also take into account some of the longer term implications for macroeconomic stability of, of financial cycles, given the major impact that, uh, macro, uh, that monetary policy has on credit, on asset prices, and on risk taking. And finally, a word about sovereign debt, which is the kind of elephant in the room. Now, we should remember that the sovereign is the ultimate backstop of the financial system. So a weak sovereign necessarily means a relatively vulnerable financial system. Uh, in fact, and moreover, initial conditions, by that I mean before the flare up in inflation, were unprecedented. We had debt, uh, public debt at historical peaks, roughly in line with World War II levels. We had interest rates at historical lows, even negative. And as a result, despite the very high levels of debt, the debt service burden never felt so light. And indeed, this provided a strong incentive to build up uh, further debt. Now, higher interest rates will severely test this. Some back of the envelope calculations would suggest that if interest rates were to go back to the level they had in the mid uh, 1990s, which was a reasonable level, then the debt service ratio of the public sector would go back up to what it was uh, at the historical peak, which was World War II. I'm talking about medians uh, across the globe. In addition to that, what we have had are large scale asset purchases on the part of the central banks, which have added to some of this sensitivity to higher interest rates. Because from a consolidated balance, uh, public sector balance sheet consolidating the central bank and the, the government, these amount to very large debt open market operations that retire long term debt, but replace it with effectively debt which is indexed at the short term rate. And by that, I mean the uh, bank reserves. Again, back of the envelope calculations suggest that for the central banks that have been most active in this type of operation, 30 to 50% of the long-term debt, government debt, is effectively at uh, index at the overnight rate. Now, this will show up as lower remittances to the government because of profits or losses on the part of the central banks, and therefore lower government revenues. Now, Structurally, structurally, the sovereign bank nexus is very hard to address effectively, and you can think of this as a kind of Achilles heel of the macroprudential frameworks. And because of that, but not only because of that, uh, it's essential to ensure the stability of fiscal positions in what has become a tougher environment because of multiple demands, shield the public against uh, the energy uh, inc price increases, upgrading military spending, facilitate the green transition, and meeting the looming uh, needs of aging populations. So I think that this is going to be a important long-term uh, financial stability challenge in the years ahead. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio. Uh, so let's now um, move to, to Ricardo. Ricardo, please.
Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here and join you at this conference devoted to understanding the risks uh, that uh, the many risks that are affecting macro financial stability right now. As the previous speakers have said, as well as President Lagarde, we are currently facing a very challenging environment for policymakers in the space of macro financial policy because there are multiple shocks affecting the financial sector that are external to the sector itself but which, as we all know from the dynamics of macrofinance, the sector will tend to propagate and generate and amplify. We have both an energy reconfiguration in Europe. We have all the geopolitical changes uh, in the horizon. We have as well um, the scar still from the pandemic that may still be reflecting themselves in the health of the banking sector, as well as certainly in terms of the labor supply in our economies. Out of all of those, out of these three though, there is a fourth one, a major risk facing our economies now, not just a risk, but a reality, a shock, and that is elevated inflation at levels well, well, well above what they were before. Inflation in the last year was, since we are in a financial stability conference and one likes to talk in terms of standard deviation shocks, the last year is 4.5 times the standard deviation inflation in the previous 20 years in the area. It is a four or five sigma shock in terms of just how large inflation has been in the last 12 months. Rightfully, the main focus at the ECB has been on eliminating this risk um, to central bank credibility inflation persisting and then delivering on its mandate that inflation should be 2%. This is a conference not about EC, the ECB monetary policy, but rather about the ESRB and macro prudential policy. And so as a result, I will not talk about how to bring inflation down, why it went up. We'll take as given that inflation has gone up. And I will also take as given what I think are relatively uncontested truths of monetary policy, which is that interest rates are going to have to rise. They've already even risen uh, in order to combat that high inflation. And finally, I will express, I will also take as given a trust in the ECB that it will deliver low inflation that is at this high inflation period is temporary. So in a period of elevated inflation, where interest rate increases are inevitable and may have already entirely happened or there's more to come, uh, and where inflation is only going to be temporary, how does this in itself pose a shock to financial stability is going to be the focus of my remarks for the remaining nine, eight or nine minutes. And I want to make three points in that regard. The first one, perhaps the most obvious, perhaps intellectually less interesting, which is not to say that quantitatively less interesting, is that a temporary burst of inflation can translate into higher inflation risk premium for many years. Insofar as, again, um, investors, consumers, households start revising up their, that standard deviation of inflation, realizing, well, five sigma events happen, and maybe it's just that you had underestimated the sigma before, perhaps in perceiving that inflation may be higher, or at least it's a risk of inflation, we may see that reflected in terms of higher compensation for risk in sense of the nominal interest rates that are charged throughout the economy. On that regard, note that it is important to note when it comes to financial stability that the last 20 years have been really quite remarkable in how much the government bond R star has fallen. A big fact of the last 20 years that affects the entire financial stability, because after all, government bonds are at the heart of any, of any financial system, is that we've had a decline of the R star on government bonds, of the interest rate at which government, governments are able to borrow, which has not been accompanied by a fall in the R star of the private sector at the interest rate, at the returns that one obtains in private investments, at the return at the interest rate at which corporates have themselves have to borrow, say. That gap, that increased wedge between the R stars, has been tried to be explained. Immediately, it means that governments have had their budget constraints greatly relaxed and has allowed, for instance, for the fiscal room that was so useful and so needed just a couple of years ago to fight the pandemic. Well, when we think about what explains it, always to the front come stories or explanations or theories that emphasize the safety of government bonds. Well, when one thinks about the risk of government bonds, there's of course a risk of default, which I would like to think continues to be quite remote for uh, the countries of the Euro area. And then secondly, there's inflation risk. That is the risks that as a bondholder you face. If inflation risk goes up, you would think that, prima facie, you would expect that what we would see is a closing of this gap, 
a closing of this special of government bonds, and an evaporation of this revenue, this debt revenue that governments have enjoyed by being able to borrow at such a low rate. Therefore, an increase in inflation risk premium would go to the heart of what um, um, has allowed public finances to be sustainable, what has allowed for a relative tranquility of government bond yields in spite of large fluctuations in government spending and government debt and large prices as we had uh, as we've had over the last 10 years. So this is certainly potentially important. However, what needs to go next, the next step is to go qualitative to quantitative and to think of how large can this inflation risk premium be. Here, I am guided by many estimates of inflation risk premium, say from the United States for the last 30, 40 years, the Cleveland Fed, through the work of Joe Albrecht and others has produced many of these series. And we tend to have inflation risk premium that can oscillate. I'm thinking here at the 10 year horizon so that we relate to government bonds. They oscillate between maybe 20, 50 basis points. That is that have a standard deviation of something like 20 basis points. In my own current research uh, with my colleague Ian Martin, we've been trying to use a series of techniques to at least provide bounds for where inflation risk premium are given the difficulty in estimating these. And we end up with bounds, which are very, these are no arbitrage bounds, so they really have to hold, that go between somewhere between, inflation risk premium being somewhere between minus 20 and maybe plus 80 basis points. These are really ranges. And so that tells me that even if there is a lack of trust of investors on, the, on, on inflation being our risk, I would expect inflation risk premium to adjust by maybe 10 basis points, if I'm pessimistic, 30 or 40 basis points. Is that put a burden on the government budget? Absolutely. Is it a burden high enough, even in this worst case scenario, to cause a financial stability problem? I do not expect that to be so. However, I want to leave one point of doubt, and that comes from my enormous respect for the research that's being done at the ECB Research Department. As shown in several speeches by especially Philip Lane just a couple of weeks ago, in showing inflation expectations extracted from using very good models developed at CB of inflation risk premium inflation expectations. The model that again is being reported at least uh, as being developed in house, um, I don't have access to it, but, uh, but that has been showed in uh, speeches by Philip Lane, shows inflation risk premium in the last 18 months having increased by 110 basis points. Now this seems to me very scary. This is what has led to, even though the increase in break even inflation having increased expectations in markets quite a lot in the five-year, five-year range. Um, again, in many speeches, um, DCB emphasizing, no, we don't think this is an, an anchoring of credibility of inflation. It's entirely inflation risk premium. But being entirely inflation risk premium does mean that because the break evens have increased by 100, 120 basis points, that's mean inflation risk premium increase of 100 basis points. Um, I'd like to think that hopefully that is not right. But again, I really feel it's my duty to mention it since uh, um, it has been a part of the inflation scenario saying the inflation risk premium have increased by such a large amount. And while often that's used to say we shouldn't worry about anchoring of inflation, I see it as a very scary sign because I've never seen an inflation risk premium that moves by 100 basis points would be complete, would be against what I what led to my um, good hopes and expectations that I just mentioned. Second risk is that beyond the aggregate risk and risk premium that comes in inflation, is that inflation being an aggregate risk is not diversifiable and therefore is going to mean that some agents in the economy are long and some are short. And here in this case, since we're talking about the financial system, let's talk about the financial system as opposed to the economy as a whole. Some institutions are going to be long on inflation risk. Some institutions are going to be short on inflation risk. Some are going to win or make gains from the last 12 months in expected inflation. Some are going to make losses. Some of those gains are going to be larger offset by the next 12 or 24 months and the success of the ECB at bringing down inflation. Some are not. It is not common because we have lost that habit for after 40, 50 years of inflation stability to think of inflation as a source of gains and losses because inflation was so small. But when you have high inflation, there are some clear winners and some clear losers, including and especially in the financial sector. Moreover, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've had the development of a very large, very deep inflation swap market in which many financial institutions have started uh, buying and selling that inflation risk, meaning that in some ways they may have either offset or in some cases enhanced the inflation risk that they have in the horizon. I think one gap we have in our knowledge now is precisely this, who is holding the inflation risk? As a rule of thumb, and certainly the data work that I have done myself in trying to use the available publicly available statistics on this, 
is that as a rough approximation, banks sell inflation risk and pension funds buy it. In other words, banks sell insurance to pension funds who have long-term liabilities against their inflation. That would suggest that over the last 12 months and the next 12 months, banks will make losses and pension funds gains in their swap contracts or at least lower losses than they had before. Are, is that shock, that source of loss for banks, enough to jeopardize financial stability? I don't think so. But if I think about one large macro risk that is perhaps not been stress tested enough, that has perhaps not been quite analyzed enough, that is the one that I would point to. Are there some banks out there that have sold a lot of inflation protection and are about to find that they therefore have to pay a lot uh, of insurance? Third risk on inflation. For the third one, uh, let me go from the inflation to the interest rates that follow it for my remaining, I think, two minutes or 90 seconds, but I'll take two minutes. Um, let me remind the audience, which I think many, certainly my panels and the colleague do not need a reminder of the terrible crisis that the euro area went through uh, 11 years ago when the mere existence of the euro was threatened as um, the sovereign debt crisis um, affected at so many countries. Both then and as well as in the years after, there's been a consensus, as consensus go in academia and policy making, that a very important ingredient in that was a so-called diabolic loop between banks and sovereigns. That is the fact that when the bond prices fall, banks would suffer large losses, those large losses would reflect themselves into both an increase in the probability they need to be bailed out or a cut in credit and tax revenues, therefore justifying and enhancing the initial falls in government bond prices. This has well been relatively well diagnosed, and even by 2015, I would say, it was relatively understood how to solve it. We needed some combination of a euro-wide safe asset that banks could hold, some combination of a penalty for a bank to hold the bonds of its sovereigns when those bonds of that sovereign become very risky in bank regulation, and third, some form of EU-wide deposit insurance that would break such a tight connection between banks and sovereigns. There were many different views on how to achieve these three the legs of the triangle. At a more expensive, expansive side, some thought that we should have euro bonds, completely euro-wide deposit insurance, and risk weights on government bonds just as with any asset. At the other extreme, at the more narrow one, and I was one of those more narrow ones in these debates a few years ago, maybe we could just have a sovereign bond-backed security, which would come with no joint liabilities, a deposit insurance that only affected only moving forward, but not covering past debts, and thirdly, maybe just some concentration limits on government bonds. But there was certainly a lot of room to disagree, uh, including on how much political commitment we'd want. In the end, I do not think I'm being overly unfair to say that very little progress was done. The ECB, the SRB noted how important this had been, how dangerous it was to keep this loop alive. But in the end, at the European Council, um, decisions were not made to advance this in any particular uh, direction in a particularly strong way. Well, now, where are we now in 2022? Interest rates have to rise or have risen already, had to rise or have to rise. Let me not try to predict monetary policy, but at least had to rise in order to control inflation. And here we are worried that an increase in interest rates will lead to a fall in the price of government bonds or increasing their yields. That may trigger losses in banks who are holding a lot of these bonds and a diabolic loop that could lead to a financial crisis. The ECB has intervened very aggressively and correctly in, in, a, a, in announcing the TIP program in order to prevent the diabolic loop from at least catching on fire. But the fact alone that we're worrying about this is somewhat tragic. And so insofar as both President Lagarde and as well as I think Alfred mentioned, um, how it is important for the European politicians and legislative bodies to take seriously these financial fragilities that were identified by these bodies. This is one of them, a main one, one that hopefully should be still well alive in the hearts and minds of politicians and policymakers, and they should take very seriously right now for it would be tragic if it was not the case. And I will conclude on that note with um, a few sentences on what is macro potential policy. Claudio, in many ways is the expert in the room on what macro policy can do and how to define it. But let me add something to what he said, to his wise words, in terms of the application or the interaction between macro potential policy and monetary policy. One perspective of macro potential policy, one, I mean, again, a compliment, uh, Claudio, uh, I think highlighted the more important ones, 
is that macro prudential policy was created by central banks in part to keep monetary policy independent. Monetary policy has to be independent from managing the public debt. We know that independent from trying to create the electoral cycle, but also independent from financial considerations insofar as we can actually raise interest rates to control inflation when needed without worrying about breaking the financial system. Now, you'll always have to worry a little bit in the same way that when you raise interest rates, you have to worry about the recession you cause and the public debt problems. But you would in part create macro policy to release monetary policy, to be able to raise interest rates, to be able to lower inflation. Therefore, in some ways, it is now from this perspective that we are now in a hiking cycle, having done so much about macro policy for 10, 15 years, that the proof is going to be in the pudding. To what extent can the ECB governing council confidently vote on interest rate increases and raise them without fearing breaking the financial sector? Because macro policy has done its job, has done its role, and is keeping the financial sector immune from crashing as a result of what needs to be done to lower inflation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. So last uh, in my list is uh, Lucrecia, please. Thank you, Pablo. It's a pleasure to be here. I must uh, say that yesterday I went to a presentation of Nuria Rubini's book on mega trends. And, um, you know, I was tempted to start with those risks, which are basically, you know, is the end of the world if you combine, uh, you know, all the things that we have been mentioned. But I will be, I will have a much more narrow focus uh, and I will uh, focus on actually three questions. So the first is really about uh, quantitative tightening and liquidity. The second is more about financial stability than inflation. And the third is on long term questions on steady states, you know, governance, re, you know, putting together, regulating, uh, you know, the different functions of macro and financial policy. So let me start with the first and with the observation uh, that uh, with be the beginning of the tightening cycle, we are not anymore in a situation in which pursuing monetary and financial policy objectives uh, imply an endogenous expansion of the balance sheet of the central bank. OK, so this is the end of the of what I call a divine co coincidence, although Alfred uh, thought that also before this crisis, we didn't have a divine coincidence. But we did have a divine coincidence in the sense that, uh, you know, whatever we did to ease uh, financial constraints or liquidity constraints led to an increase in the balance sheet. And then that was the same for, you know, QE for monetary po policy purposes. Now, today, with tightening monetary policy, but the emergence of financial stability risk, policy may require to tighten and ease at the same time. So the first question is about liquidity and the liquidity risk uh, that we are facing uh, in the tightening cycle. And the question on a positive sense is how we can use these balance sheet tools uh, uh, to do, to do you know, both easily easing and tightening. And, um, and you know, this leads to the question, how do we understand the interaction between regulation and monetary policy? So how Oh, we can use balance sheet policy to tighten for monetary policy purpose and to ease for financial stability objectives. Now, let me just say in something that, uh, you know, maybe there will not be consensus around that, but in principle, central banks have the capacity to act as market makers if stress emerges in the, emerge in the financial markets and implement QT at the same time. Of course, if this is the case, if the shocks is not, a mega shock, okay, systematic shock. And, you know, for example, they can sell long by QT and buy short for the financial stability purposes. And we have seen many examples, successful, successful examples of that. For example, I'm here referring to, you know, the, the recent uh, small crisis in the UK, which was successfully dealt with by the Bank of England with uh, very little uh, asset purchases. At the end, they only, you know, spent, you know, 20 billions uh, in, in asset purchases. And also successfully, this was successfully done in the US, uh, you know, in recent times when uh, tensions in treasury markets uh, appear. In a way, this is also the idea behind the TPI, you know, the new instrument that the ECB has put on the table. The idea is there is that even in a quantitative 
in a tightening cycle, you can intervene in segment of financial markets to address issues of transmission of monetary policy. This has not been tested. We will see how uh, you know things will be if uh, we get there. Now, uh, having said that, however, what I'm worrying about is that uh, there are structural reasons why this kind of central bank interventions uh, for financial stability purposes will have to be more frequent in the future. And this actually, to me, it poses a, a, a fundamental question of architecture and uh, you know, the relationship between financial regulations and the use of balance sheet. Now, let me give it give you some examples so okay this example the first example especially relates to the us it has been observed that even with a system of ample reserves so that more than one trillion of dollars in the us there have been episodes of liquidity stress in all jurisdictions and in the us especially not only during COVID, but also you know in in other uh, at other occasions and uh, you know and people have been worrying uh, have been asking whether this is a paradox or not okay and there are many reasons to believe that this is actually is not a paradox uh, one thing that uh, um that I, I think is quite worrisome uh, and it has happened since the uh, great financial crisis is uh, you know struggles transformation in the financial markets uh, which uh, um, which lead uh, okay so to this high probability for liquidity crisis uh, to emerge on the supply side you know the you, the regulations on capital charges on treasuries have penalized uh, the the banks the market makers to run large balance sheet those institutions do not want to uh, run large balance sheet indeed the inventories of market making banks have collapsed since the great financial crisis but on the demand size we have seen an increase of concentration of asset management so now those institutions the asset managers have huge balance sheet while the market makers have small balance sheet and uh, you know this leads to a kind of structural mismatch uh, which has is one of the reasons why the market has been pro to to liquidity to liquidity issues if you talk to to uh, to investment bankers they will tell you we cannot uh, you know assault you know provide that kind of functional market making uh, as it did in the past of course you know it's a matter of prices but uh, you know there is a discussion a regulatory discussion on on uh, um you know the fact that those regulations uh, uh, that we implemented for good reason after the financial crisis is just surveys hoarding incentives during time of stress. Now, if we go to the eurozone, uh, uh, a second example, we, you know, uh, there has been a big discussion about um, the dash for collateral rather than the dash for cash that we have seen uh, in the US. And, uh, you know, this is clearly has emerged with quantitative tightening we have seen a shortage of collateral there are many reasons of that there is no time to to go through them some of these reasons uh, have to do with regulation some have you know relates to the current situation of extreme high volatility um but today um you know the the problem i mean in the eurozone this is kind of a, a fundamental problem because uh, partly of the problem uh, uh, comes from the fact that, that uh, you know there is, there is a shortage uh, of high quality collateral due to the fact that you know we don't have a euro area yield curve so that uh, when this demand for high quality collateral arises that goes into the form of demand for german bonds and uh, uh, and there are not enough of them around okay so you know in all jurisdiction the sovereign market is the bedrock of the financial system uh, in the eurozone uh, you know this kind of uh, flow in the design which of course has uh, you know good justifications uh, uh, you know for you know, the political and fiscal framework uh, you know lead us particularly you know make us particularly vulnerable to this uh, kind of uh, uh, you know liquidity issues or, or shortage of collateral issues uh, during period of high volatility now, of course, there are policy remedies for doing that. I mean, uh, you know, the reverse repos, uh, flexibility of asset purchases, uh, etc. But uh, the, the 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 question I want to put on the table is that, uh, you know, 
what is actually the design that we have in mind, okay? So if there are these structural changes that uh, have led to this kind of, uh, uh, you know, or pro to, to the, you know, to, to, to this fragility and, uh, you know, vulnerability, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to changes in volatility. Um, on the other hand, on one hand, you know, it is, kind of reassuring to see that the central bank have the power to act. That's the good example of the UK or the good example of the US. But actually, you could think asymptotically to a system in which actually the central bank replaces the market in the market making function. And then the question is, is this really what we want? OK, so and if it is not, how should we design regulation in a way so that, uh, uh, you know, everybody does its job in a sense? There is, you know, I, I can see that, uh, you know, there, we need some clarity of what is the direction of travel. So that is my first point on liquidity. So I want to, you know, I wanted to put the kind of uh, provocative question on the table. The second point I want to discuss is uh, inflation and financial stability, you know, beyond the liquidity, um, you know, fighting inflation to stabilize expectation is obviously a must. Um, the question is how fast and at what level to stop. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, the forum to discuss about monetary policy, as Ricardo said. But, you know, from a macro perspective, the question today is where is the natural rate of interest? And this will guide us the end point of the tightening cycle. Now, however, with tightening uh, financial risk grow, okay, Ricardo emphasized the risk of uh, high inflation. But of course, uh, you know, there are, you know, bigger risks that we're facing today. Uh, so I emphasize liquidity, but of course, there is credit, asset prices, uh, leverage. Uh, and indeed, if you look at the index of financial condition, it's really going south. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's correlated uh, negatively with the probability of recessions. We have seen from Bloomberg that the probability under the section one year from now is 80%. So we need to ask at what level of the real interest rate the credit constraints will generate a fully fledged financial crisis. Now there are fragility uh, you know, accumulating, but we know that it's very easy to, to go from one regime of moderate uh, um, vulnerability to, uh, you know, to, to a situation in which the spreads will, will spike. And we know that from empirical regularities that those uh, are very much, uh, you know, that there is this non-linear correlation between uh, between output uh, and, uh, and and financial stability. Now, markets expect that the rate hike cycle is going to end sometimes in early 2023, uh, but the rates will stay longer, uh, higher for longer. So this, you know, would uh, spell ongoing pressure to the leverage, uh, especially in 2024, where there is a fair amount of corporate debt uh, to be refinanced. And, uh, um, you know, although some that the, the leveraging is desirable, you know, there is a question, you know, that at some point, okay, so that uh, there is that other interest rate, this is a point that uh, has been studied quantitatively by, by paper and the New York Fed, there is another equilibrium interest rate, which is the financial stability equilibrium interest rate. And, uh, you know, the price stability and the financial stability equilibrium interest rate may not be at the same level, and uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, then the question is uh, when that financial stability equilibrium level will be binding, what will happen to monetary policy? So I guess that this is also the question that Ricardo asked, you know, will the financial stability concerns dominate over monetary policy? Is the macro prudential framework that we have robust enough? So third third part of my uh, discussion is more about the steady state questions uh, and here i have basically in two parts one is more nerd is really about the plumbing of monetary policy and uh, you know of course we are we are uh, now going into qt but okay there is the question so what is the size of the central bank's balance sheet that we envisage in the steady state in normal circumstances um, now, since the financial crisis, uh, central banks have operated uh, in a system which is called a system of ample reserves, so accommodating demand for liquidity. Now the balance sheet is shrinking, uh, but at what level? Okay. Uh, now, 
a common view is something that uh, Ricardo and I wrote in, in, in a recent uh, report uh, is that, uh, you know, the balance sheet should be at least as large as the demand for reserves. OK, so that's uh, kind of an application of the three my rule, but no larger. However, we have seen that this demand for reserves uh, is quite volatile and, you know, prone to strategic uh, issues, hoarding and so on. Indeed, there is recent studies from the BIS, but also from the New York Fed, that um, show that even in a system of ample reserves, uh, we have strategic cash hoarding, uh, so that uh, uh, rates in the market of reserves are still very sensitive to shocks. So this creates uh, a dependence to central bank liquidity, as I had argued in my first point. Uh, and this, you know, in a way, this is an argument for keeping the central bank uh, balance sheet large, you know, for precautionary reasons. But, of course, there are a lot of problems with keeping that uh, balance sheet large. And these problems have more to do, you know, with uh, fiscal footprints, moral hazard, the killing the markets. I mean, all those questions that, you know, are the byproduct of, uh, you know, uh, central banks being such big intermediary in the market. Uh, so again here i think that there is a problem of an interaction between the regulatory framework uh, the central bank size uh, uh, will have to be understood in that uh, in in that discussion i see that this is not a discussion that uh, we have been focusing very much in europe but i think that's an important one and then of course in the eurozone we are confronted with the deeper issues uh, uh, which is the fact that we don't have um, you know that kind of euro safe asset uh, so that uh, the central bank uh, you know is called for action even in a more kind of structural sense in order to defend the stability of the sovereign debt market uh, and here not just talking about movement in bonds which are justified by fundamentals but uh, you know this, this kind of adjustment uh, which gives a particular privilege to the German Bund. So, uh, okay, so uh, having said that, uh, this is, so this is the plumbing, but then, you know, there is, the, you know, more macro questions, which, um, you know, is uh, with large balance sheet and monetary and fiscal interaction. Now, this is, uh, again, is something that uh, Claudio has already uh, mentioned um, with, increase interest with movement in interest rate which now are much larger than anticipated the, the risk that we were all aware of uh, in you know the balance sheet uh, uh, of, of you know the, the maturity mismatch that uh, that uh, we have developed uh, in the in the central bank's balance sheet uh, you know means that uh, you know the, the possibility of those losses which are just a theoretical and kind of curiosity are now materializing and in fact, we have seen that, uh, you know, including the Bank of England has run into a negative capital. So some banks are getting into negative capital, some are making losses. Uh, now, as we know, this is not a problem per se, but uh, it creates issues of governance between the different authorities, between the monetary and the fiscal authorities. And uh, this is particularly difficult problem in the Eurozone when there is uh, quite a lot of um, you know, lack of transparency is about how the dividends are distributed, the capital, the banks are recapitalized and so on. Now, long term, this issue of monetary and fiscal policy goes beyond, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, infrastructure issues. Uh, and um, I think actually, if we if we go, uh, if we look at, at the real long term issues, uh, it is likely, I don't see any I mean, I know that in your reports, the central banks write, uh, you say, you know, fiscal policy have to be, you know, you have to be careful, you, you know, the measures to sustain households, they have to be temporary and measure and so on. But we know that the risk we are going to face, uh, the climate transitions, uh, you know, the geopolitical issues, uh, possibly new health, uh, uh, you know, episodes, uh, materializing which we know you know are, are, are also link uh, you know to climate change and so on would mean that uh, you know there will have to be more unfunded government spending so, i mean that is a trend okay and it's hard to think in a situation 
in which okay this is happening uh, uh, and without having the possibility of of, uh, of financial repressions uh, which we had in the 80s okay what is going to happen about the relationship between the fiscal and the monetary authorities and it is hard to think that that system of rigid separations that we have had since the 90s is going to survive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucrecia. Thank you very much uh, to the four of, of you. Um, so we have still 15 minutes uh, for uh, for discussion. Uh, what I would suggest is that I, I pick um, three questions um and i will uh, make these three questions uh, in advance and then you pick uh, up uh, whatever you you want to 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 react uh, um those questions have been raised to a certain extent by by the audience as well um and are related to to banks uh, first uh, second to non banks uh, and then uh, third on um, the bank sovereign nexus that uh, some of you were uh, also uh, 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 identifying and, and emphasizing so maybe the, the first one is very much related to a point that was made by by Claudio. And uh, to what extent do you think that the macro prudential uh, policy should play a role, uh, an stabilizer uh, role um, as compared to, to fiscal and of course um, uh, monetary policy? Um, and you were very clear, uh, Claudio, on defending um, a positive neutral CCYB. OK. Uh, I guess uh, a related question to that one is to to what extent do you think that this should be done on top of the capital requirements that we have today? So, which if it, if this is the case, of course, it could lead to higher capital uh, requirements uh, over the cycle. Or alternatively, this should be done at the expense of reducing other structural capital requirements. Okay, which. Uh, I guess in the end, all this question is very much related to what are your views on the optimal level of uh, capital requirements for, for, for banks and whether uh, we have achieved that, uh, that level with the current uh, regulation. That's the first easy question. Um, <laughs> the second question that uh, was um, also raised by, by, by some people from, from the audience um, and perhaps uh, uh, here, uh, we were not so concrete and so specific in, in the initial remarks that you provided is about um, uh, the non-banks. So um, the specific question uh, that as it was raised by, by the audience is, well, we have currently bank-based macroprudential framework in Europe. Uh, and uh, the audience was uh, asking about what uh, are your views in terms of the critical steps and the dimensions we should consider to develop macro uh, potential policy uh, framework for non-banks. OK, the, perhaps whether we can be a bit more uh, specific uh, uh, here. And then third, on the um, on the bank uh, sovereign nexus, I mean, of course, Ricardo uh, was uh, very explicit uh, on the, emphasizing this point and also of the lack of action in Europe in order to solve this uh, this problem. Um, there was a, a comment by by the audience uh, saying, well, that to a certain extent, we have overlooked, or, or you have overlooked, uh, uh, Ricardo, in your remarks, the establishment of a resolution framework in the European Union. And uh, the specific question was whether the, this is a, an oversight or a statement about the resolution framework that uh, that we have. Um, and uh, maybe putting it in a more, more general uh, um, uh, um, term, uh, to what extent we think that this is really a problem. OK, now in terms of uh, uh, can be a problem in the following in the following years. Uh, also related to to what uh, Lucrezia said at the at the end of uh, her remarks. Um, and what could be your priorities in terms of solving uh, these problems? And regardless, you were mentioning several um, uh, proposals that were made um, during the, the sovereign uh, debt, uh, European sovereign debt crisis, uh, but most of them have not been uh, applied in, in, in practice. So maybe to be uh, specific on what would be in your uh, in your views uh, the, the the priority in order to solve this problem uh, could be also a, an interesting uh, answer for 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 this specific question. So um, we have uh, like yeah five uh, maybe I can uh, even uh, add five more minutes ten minutes uh, for quick reactions to this question. I don't know maybe uh, I can start with Alfred and uh, and we'll continue with the same order. 
uh, that we we, we did that uh, with the with the initial intervention. So please, Alfred. Yeah, maybe I uh, start us off on the uh, question with regard to uh, macro regional and uh, non banks. Uh, I think one uh, some some of the challenges uh, to to overcome is when when you're looking at uh, that uh, 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 the way we have been dealing with uh, the non bank financial intermediaries in in the EU. It was a focus on micro prudential uh, regulation, uh, in particular consumer protection issues, and so. Uh, we need more analysis and a better understanding of the uh, macro prudential uh, angle and focusing on systemic risks. I think that is one uh, bias to overcome. Uh, I would say one, one uh, a second issue is uh, uh, non-bank financial intermediaries are uh, across countries and uh, macro prudential regulation and uh, supervision is uh, country specific. So that will require uh, more effort in terms of cross-border coordination. Uh, maybe that could include the ESRB and the uh, and ESMA uh, in in terms of finding a solution. And that is also an issue uh, which uh, is a general uh, problem with uh, 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 non-banks uh, getting rid or overcoming uh, the data gap issue. Uh, we still lack uh, the data we have uh, available in 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 the banking system. And again, cross-border. Uh, coordination and cross-border work uh, could probably be helpful in in terms of uh, 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 overcoming the data problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfred. Uh, Claudio. Well, uh, thank you, Pablo. Yes, you gave me a very easy question. So, um, so let me say first of all, I, I'm going to uh, answer it on, on a personal basis. Um, um, the if you ask me, I, I'm very much in. Paul Walker's camp, when once he was asked what's the optimal level of capital, he basically said, I don't know, just raise it. Um, I think we've made uh, huge progress over the years, but it seems to me that partly because of political economy constraints, uh, we tend to, although we try to raise capital standards, it's always a bit difficult to raise them as much as, uh, as, uh, as one would like. So that's the, that's the short answer. The um, if again, if I had to choose, if you have the level of capital, maximum level of capital as given, would I have more of a, if you like, counter cyclical capital buffer relative to a conservation buffer? Um, I think that yes, if you have that constraint, there is some room for maneuver to uh, to play around there. Um, uh, I always felt that the, and I was involved in the development of the counter cyclical capital buffer, that the 2.5 uh, ceiling was uh, rather low if we wanted the, the buffer to act as a proper buffer. And I, and I think that what uh, there has been, uh, as you know, a, a, um, a huge debate recently as to whether buffers are usable, not usable, and, and so on. And I think that that's partly because there is a bit of a, I wouldn't say confusion, but sometimes there are two things that are that are conflated. Um, the structural or conservation buffer and the countercyclical capital buffer both have one objective in common, which is avoid banks entering to resolution that is hitting the minimum, but they do it in different ways. The countercyclical buffer is doing it in order to avoid collective retrenchment when things uh, when things go bad, which could amplify um, uh, perverse dynamics in the system. The conservation buffer does it by increasing the penalties as the bank get close to the minimum. Uh, in a way, it's like a form of prompt corrective action light, uh, call it prompt corrective action light, which means that banks will never, never be willing to dip into the, into the buffer voluntarily because they are subject to penalties. Um, and because of that, I, I, I feel that maybe there is more room to to play with the a proper buffer as opposed to with a, a penalty uh, buffer as the as the conservation buffer is. But more generally, let me say that if, uh, as you know, a lot of countries have uh, quite a number of pillar two type um, uh, regulations. Um, and I think that if you have the stomach, Based on what I have just said, I think there would be room to improve the clarity of purpose 
of those uh, of those various buffers and tools, align them with the with the objective, and also align the control of those uh, of those various pillar two um, measures with the right perspective. So if it plays a macroprudential countercyclical role, then you would have a macroprudential authority dealing with it. If on the other hand, it's more a bank specific role, then you have a macroprudential authority. Micro -prudential. Thank you, thank you, Claudio. Um, Ricardo? Very good. So on bank resolution, two points, one more general and one more specific. Uh, I certainly welcome the bank resolution advance as a directive and uh, implementation of bank resolution in the euro area. I think it's a step in the right direction in many ways. Um, I think it's fair to say it's a system that hasn't been fully tested yet, but that certainly in principle and ex ante seems to be an adequate one. However, note that uh, to say that when it comes to the issues that we are discussing of these bank sovereign nexus and the way in which things can be amplified, to think that a resolution system by itself changes those dynamics, it won't. I mean, if anything, a bank resolution by itself can amplify them uh, by itself. I mean, you really have to have, I know of no bank resolution system in the entire world at any date in time that does not come with resolution still coming with deadweight losses, with disturbance, with propensity for runs in fast systems to propensity for panics. Uh, bank resolution in its isolation. So I don't think bank resolution by its isolation does not solve the nexus, but certainly can weaken them, especially as complement with other policies. But moreover, and specifically on bank resolution, we haven't had a lot of experience with it, but let me note the experience, perhaps one of the more notable ones of the few case studies we've had of the new directive, which is the case of the Banco Espírito Santo in Portugal, that left a massive bill for taxpayers. Yes, we preserve financial stability and we're very happy about how maybe at the SRB and the ECB uh, that problem was handled the resolution, but the Portuguese taxpayers are not very happy with the very large bill that they've ended up having to foot and which they're still paying actually. So even now, still the, the person, um, the company that bought the bank uh, is still getting payments from the taxpayer to support it. So I think again, and this just shows again, if was it not for the solidity of public finances in Portugal in the last decade and how well run they have been in a very prudent way, I'm not sure if we would not have seen a loop, uh, but this came at a large, loss and expense to the Portuguese taxpayer, and let's not sweep that under the rug. On the priorities, I'll be very brief because I hope that this will be a cue for Lucrezia and given the lack of time. I think when we talk about the priorities, I am sensitive to especially the creation, not the creation, the expansion of euro-wide safe assets, either through the expansion of the uh, pandemic bonds that were created or through its complementing with much larger ambitious programs of sovereign bond backed securities and others. Why? Because that not only adds in this dimension, it would also add in the implementation of monetary policy and it would add on two points. It would help on two points that were crucial, that were importantly highlighted by Lucrezia. One on this discussion of ample reserves in that then the ample reserves would be matched by a euro wide safe facet on the other side of the balance of the central bank, allowing a clarification of what they are there for, as opposed to a confusion. And as Lucrezia herself highlighted, a certain treatment of different sovereigns and different perspectives that comes with ample reserves. And second, also, because precisely as Lucrezia said, and so I'm really going to uh, completely adopt what she said 20 minutes ago, uh, if we are going into a future in which we're going to have um, tightening cycles, different directions, tightening and easing at the same time, then I'd really want to separate what is UI, I'd say UI bonds versus what is what is intervening in one particular sovereign debt market versus another because of some macro prudential risk or another. So it becomes even more. So not only sovereign access, but also with the two arguments in the said, ample reserves and these different tightenings. It seems then that the uh, expansion of the creation, the expansion of a deep EU-wide safe asset market seems to me to be the priority. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ricardo. Um, Lucrecia, you have the, the last uh, word. Yeah, the last word. Well, I mean, uh, Ricardo and I, we spent the best years of our youth thinking of European reforms <laughs> without much result. You know? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, at the end, resolution is important, in my view, more, more important than deposit insurance because the depositors are, are very uh, senior. On the other hand, uh, uh, you know, the issue is fiscal, okay? So, 
when there are banking crises, uh, uh, you know, banks are national in death, like it has been said, and, and then there is a big resistance by member states, uh, you know, to, to kind of uh, delegate, uh, you know, you know to, uh, to, a, um, to a European authority. So um, the doom loop will stay with us uh, because of uh, the correlation between uh, bank risk and, and sovereign debt risk, but also because the correlation between banks and the real economy, and this is going to be really material today, maybe more than in the past, because the ECB is more present uh, in the government debt market than it was 10 years ago. Oh, but at the end, okay, so uh, this to me is, is a fiscal and is a governance issue. So um, if there is no risk, fiscal resharing and there is no resharing through the financial markets, so then uh, in a monetary union, there is resharing through the balance sheet of, of the central bank. Okay, there is no other way. And this is not very healthy, as we all know. So if there is a direction of travel, it should be in the direction of agreeing on a, a common, you know, yield curve, you know, a robust, you know, <laughs> or euro. And so that means uh, we know that this cannot be done even because it's against the game. So recently I wrote something with several co-authors and lawyers to see what are really the, the, the you know, the, the the constraints, uh, the legal constraints for going in that direction. So I think it is going to take time. This is not something for tomorrow, but okay, the pandemic response uh, was a positive step and uh, the use in exceptional circumstances of these kind of tools, uh, it will create precedent that will make this discussion easier in the next 20 years, I don't know, something like that. But, you know, we need it, okay? Because if we don't do it, okay, just, you know, don't be, you know, the central banks will be there or otherwise it's a goodbye to Europe. Yeah, thank you. It's very, very clear, uh, Lucrecia. Um, okay, so I think we have now to, to close uh, this uh, panel. Thank you very much to the four of, uh, of you. It was uh, indeed uh, very, very interesting. I'm pretty sure that the audience has also found the conversation very interesting. Um, there is a lot of uh, food uh, for thought in, in your in your remarks, uh, food that will fit for sure uh, our discussions at the ESRB and maybe even at the European uh, Council in particular, this uh, last part of the of the discussion, hopefully. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that you have a, a nice day and back to you, uh, Connie. Thank you, Governor Hernandez de Cos, and thank you to the panel members for this very insightful discussion.